Rafi Devers signs an extension with the Red Sox. Eric Hosmer goes to the Cubs. What does this mean for Blaze Jordan and Matt Mervis? You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked on MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, baseball writer and podcaster. Thank you for making this your first listen every single day. And news breaking late on Wednesday, Rafael Devers is in agreement with the Boston Red Sox, 11 years, $331 million. So he's not leaving Boston anytime soon. You kind of feel like Heim Bloom had to make this signing after losing, uh, trading away Mookie Betts and then losing Xander Bogarts, it kind of feels like if he didn't re-sign Rafi that you probably were going to have Boston fans beating down the door of Fenway Park to come get him, drag him out in the street. So what does this mean for some of the guys there? And the prospect that I immediately think about is your highest rated third base prospect in Blaze Jordan, right? So a 2023rd rounder out of high school, big boy, 6'2", 220. And there's been some questions. There was already some questions about could he stick at third or not. And so I think in the end, this doesn't do a lot uh, as far as moving the needle for Blaze Jordan. He was probably already going to have to move to first base. Uh, he has a really very large frame. And speed is already, I'd say, below average, probably 40 grade. And the defense is slightly below average at third base. And so the arm strength matches, plus arm strength. He can play third base uh, arm strength wise, but defensively, range wise, it's already not necessarily there. And so I think he was destined to end up at first base anyway. What this does do is I do think this gives Boston the flexibility now. You just signed Justin Turner. You've already, you've decided you were promoting Tristan Cassis and making him the starting first baseman on opening day. And so now I think this gives you the option to uh, try to rebuild some value in Bobby Dahlbeck and then trade him. He's actually a better third baseman than first baseman, but he's been playing first out of deference to, to Devers. And so what this will do on the trade market is this will present a corner infield option in Bobby Dahlbeck who can be flipped at the deadline or possibly even earlier, you know, as soon as spring, if you want, if a team feels like they can bring back the offense that he did not have last year. The more interesting one to me, this felt like a slam dunk. This had to happen, right? The more interesting one to me, I think, is Eric Hosmer to the Cubs. I've seen a lot of people who were talking about, you know, signing Eric Hosmer. All this does is this hurts Matt Mervis. This takes away your ability to, to have Matt Mervis play first base every day. You're blocking Matt Mervis. I think that this gives you some flexibility and some options and a runway for Matt Mervis. This isn't necessarily a bad thing if you do this the right way. So Eric Hosmer last year spent some time with the Padres, spends a little bit of time with the Red Sox because he famously does not want to go to Washington in the Juan Soto deal. So he then gets flipped to Boston. Combined slash on in 104 games last year, 268, 334, 382, eight home runs, 27 extra base hits, 37 walks to 64 strikeouts. That's not a guy who is keeping Matt Mervis on the bench if Matt Mervis is playing well. Reminder on who Matt Mervis was, 2020 undrafted free agent out of Duke. Again, we're not worried about an undrafted free agent in 2020. Uh, had a surge last year. He did some, some, some mechanical changes, shortened the swing a bit. Uh, focus a little bit more on identifying what was in kind of his power zone where he could drive at the middle third of the plate and crushes last year. 137 games between high A, double A, triple A. 309, 379, 605. 36 home runs, 78 extra base hits. Again, in 137 games. So better than one every other game. 50 walks to 107 strikeouts, two or two on stolen bases. That is not the slash line of a guy that is blocked by Eric Hosmer. That is 
the slash line of a guy who you were giving the option to first base or DH every day, and you are playing Hosmer around it, matchups, things like that. He Now, I will give you, Mervis is not a great runner, uh, and he's not great defensively. He has a very powerful arm. He was a pitcher in, in college, could hit 96. And so you're not moving him to third base. He's staying at first. But you could always play Hosmer at first and DH Mervis. I don't necessarily think that you have to do one or the other. Like, you have to decide now. I do think there's very much the ability to uh, see how he's doing during the season. You can build in breaks as you need to. But if you approach this correctly with the we want to make sure that Matt Mervis has an opportunity to play and hit for power, and we have Eric Hosmer here on a veteran's minimum salary because San Diego's paying him the rest of the money that's owed for the next couple of years, that we're going to put him, we're going to put Matt Mervis in situations where he can punish fastballs, you know, pull the ball out of the park, and then if he starts to show some of the issues with chasing breaking pitches low, and things like that that strike that roll up the strikeouts, we have the option to give him a break because we have Eric Hosmer who can step in for him. That's the best way to handle this. And the best way to think about this, uh, depth will always work itself out. So don't be nervous that now you have Eric Hosmer and Patrick Wisdom and Matt Mervis all to take up first base and DH at bats. Wisdom can play some third base, so can Christopher Morrell. But then also you have the like it'll work itself out. It'll take care of it. Some other signings which are going to lead to some possible trades. Gene Sakura signs with the Marlins, two years, seventeen million dollars, and he's moving to third base. And so what's interesting about this to me is this is not like as far as we understand, he hadn't necessarily played third base in his career yet. Uh, But you have Jazz Chisholm at second base, who is a dynamic talent and provided that he's healthy, is going to come back. And then Miguel Rojas has struggled to hit. And you have an option where Segura can come in and play short if you need him to. uh, But he's kicking out to third. He's been about 10% above league average as a hitter every year except for that first year in Philly in 2019. This now kind of gives you some options as far as You have depth, and so if you want to make trades, because again, you have not filled that center field spot like we've talked about. Uh, Apparently, connecting the dots here on on this first segment, uh, Miami was in contact with Boston trying to get Tristan Cassis from Boston. Boston's like, nope, we're not trading Tristan Cassis, which is a smart move. I agree, don't do that. And so there's a potential trade that could be made here Uh, The Marlins could send a pitcher. Pablo Lopez is the one that you automatically think of, given how long he's been in trade talks. But you've got a Trevor Rogers, you've got Edward Cabrera, you have multiple options. And then they've got a couple hitters, infielders, on expiring deals in a Joey Wendell, who's incredibly versatile, can play anywhere in the infield. Uh, And a Garrett Cooper, who can play the corners, who can play in the outfield as well. And so you have some trade options here if you want to package these guys together to make a move. The Marlins are open to trading a pitcher, probably not more than one. You've got these two guys you can move as well since you signed Segura. You've got extra infield options. And a trade that I think makes a lot of sense for both teams would be Pablo Lopez to the Padres or Trent Grisham. The Padres are trying to move Grisham and or Hassan Kim because they want to make sure they have room for Bogarts. They're putting Tatis in the outfield with Soto. And then if you keep Kim and he's at second base with Machado at third, you have to move Cronenworth to first base. And that kind of feels like a, 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 you're, you're wasting his, his above average defense at first base. So they're looking at moving Grisham or Kim. And if you move Grisham, you can send Grisham to Miami. Miami has a center fielder that can play good defense and can give you some offense. and. Pablo Lopez can come in and fortify this rotation in San Diego. In just a minute, I want to get into some of the needs as far as developing pitching and some of the needs as far as figuring out your infield. 
But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at BetOnline. BetOnline BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. You can get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, uh, whether it's the NFL's Week 18, the national championship matchup between Georgia and TCU, which I believe our college channel is going to do a great little uh, roundtable or or crossover for that. So check that out. Uh, basketball, both the NBA and college basketball in full swing right now. They've got everything at betonline.net. It's the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action because BetOnline is where the game starts. Okay, so Baseball America wrote a piece just recently about New Year's resolutions for different organizations. Obviously, we did our own the last couple of days, but I thought a couple of these were interesting, and I wanted to pull some of these out. So one of the things that they said uh, was about developing pitching, and it's two different teams in two different scenarios. So the first team that they mentioned is the Seattle Mariners, and they said their resolution in 2023 needs to be to just grow some more pitching prospects. They overhauled the pitching development program a few years ago, kind of changed up the way they were doing a lot of stuff, how they were evaluating players, how they were trying to build them into big leaguers. And you saw a payoff of that. George Kirby, Logan Gilbert, Matt Brash, they were all played big parts in the 2022 playoff push. And then having the other pitching prospects that they developed with the revamped program gave them assets that they could use to get Luis Castillo, to get Eugenio Suarez, things like that. But they've graduated 10 prospects and they've traded 23. And so there's not a ton of depth in the system. And so what they need to do is kind of figure out which one of their guys can step up, fill a hole in the rotation when you need an extra starter and be part of that next wave of pitching prospects. The rotation as of now lines up to be Luis Castillo, who was just recently extended, Logan Gilbert, Robbie Ray, George Kirby, and Marco Gonzalez. I think you can probably improve a little bit on Marco Gonzalez, but there are much worse fifth starters out there than Marco Gonzalez. And looking at some of the guys here and, and, and some of the options you're going to have, I think about a guy like a Taylor Dollar, 2025th rounder out of Cal. A fantastic year last year, 16-2 and two in the minors. Again, we don't care about record that much, but that was noticeable. Uh, and the big thing is he's, he's always going to be a control artist, right? So the best pitch is the slider, um, above average to to plus, depending on on who looks at it. The fastballs, you know, 92 to 91, touches 94, not that great, right? Curveball's a little bit below below average. Change up, it's kind of fringy, uh, and it's really just like a distraction thing. So it's kind of a a two-pitch thing right now, more control than power. But he's got a good frame, 6'3", 195. Uh, he he can add a little bit more. We saw what he did in the fall, looked really good. And so this is something where Taylor Dollard has an opportunity to get him in your pitching development program for another year, get him obviously in the, the weight room and in the, the physical development, but work on work on unlocking the stuff, right? Uh, you need him to to be able to land the curveball consistently for strikes. You need the change up to run a little more away from bats. And so Taylor Dollard has the pieces that he can do. Flip side off of Taylor Dollard is Emerson Hancock. Same draft, first rounder out of UGA there in 2020. And the Emerson Hancock story is the stuff's great, right? Uh, I mean, very good stuff. Fastball, four seamer, 96 to 98. Got a two seamer, sits mid, you know, 93 to 95. Um, I think a two seamer is better than the four seamer, but both of them are good pitches. Has a slider, kind of a sweepy slider, right around 80 miles an hour. Uh, change up sits mid 80s as well. And everything disguises and blends pretty well. But he's trying, he's been throwing harder. He's been trying to throw harder. The controls backed up a bit. Uh, 99 innings, he walked 38 guys last year. And then to go along with that, uh, there's it's it's obviously, and I'm I'm not a doctor. It's obviously causing some sort of strain or stress. He was on the injured list twice last year with the shoulder, and when you kind of combine the arm slot 
and the extra effort, the extra force he's having to put behind these pitches trying to increase the velo. It's something where now you're a little bit worried. This is your reliever risk we talked about. And so something where if they can get a natural development of that additional power or they can rein in the control and and decrease the injury risk, then Emerson Hancock is probably your next big pitching prospect. Uh, I'm still a believer in some of the guys in the system. Brian Wu had Tommy John in 2021, uh, looking to see him ease his way back this year, but had a lot of really promising stuff beforehand. Looking at a guy like a Perlander Baroa, Bryce Miller, both of these guys, I think, have injury, uh, uh, have reliever risk concerns. There's questions. Miller, for instance, I mean, he can run that fastball up to 97 miles an hour as a reliever. It kind of sits lower 90s as a starter. Uh, but the changeup comes and goes. The curveball's kind of fringy. And the consistency deeper into starts isn't really there. So it kind of feels like as of now, he profiles as a starter. I'm sorry, he profiles as a reliever. But let him continue to try to start. Let's see if we can get, get the efficiency deeper in the games, get the consistency, keep the motion, keep everything going, uh, keep him in that role. The other team that they talk about as far as developing pitching, I thought was interesting, was the Chicago White Sox. But they want him to do something a little bit different. The Chicago White Sox, they're not saying develop a pitching prospect. With the White Sox, and I agree with this, they're saying develop one top-tier pitching prospect. The White Sox have put a lot of effort into acquiring pitching prospects. They've got some, uh, the rotation's good, right? Dylan Cease, Lance Lynn, Lucas Giolito, Michael Kopech, Mike Clevenger. I mean, it's a good rotation, but they don't have the, the amazing guys behind them. And they put a lot of effort into it, right? So top three picks in 2022, um, pitchers. All five picks in 2020, pitchers. 2019, they gave a couple big bonuses to pitching prospects. And it's like, out of all of those guys, the only thing that you've gotten at the big league level out of that is 60 innings of Garrett Crochet in relief, and he's now out with Tommy John. And so you've got all of these prospects, and you need a couple of them to stick. And I think some of the options, so Noah Schultz is really intriguing to me. So Big, big boy, 6'9", 220. And some amazing tools for Noah Schultz. I love the fastball, right? So the, 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 the fastball, somewhere between 65 and a 70 grade. Two-seamer, um, you know, sits 96, 97. Uh, kind of just, it's, it comes up really sudden on you. And part of this is he's 6'9", so he's got the extension. It's closer to the plate. It plays up off of the velo, uh, can get a lot of swing and miss in the zone with it. It runs kind of runs away from bats and guys will, guys will miss it to go along with it. The slider, I think it's a plus pitch. It sits low eighties has a lot of late sweep to it. And so, uh, it is, I mean, it, it just takes a hard turn out of the strike zone at the very end. And so the movement is so drastic, so d dramatic that it works against both lefties and righties. Uh, he has a, a, a changeup, kind of average now, has a lot of like hard fade to it, but it's, it's mostly used against righties just to keep them from sitting slider, which you have to do that. He throws both the fastball and the slider for strikes a lot. And so the big things you worry about with those super tall pitchers is you worry about the the proception and you know and and keeping all the long levers in line. Uh, he has a a kind of a unique wind up that he does. It looks like he starts in the stretch, does some stuff, so really really keeps everything in sync, keeps everything in line to the plate and in motion. Uh, so I'm not too worried there. The big thing here is make sure that the control sticks around as he develops a little bit more physically, because he's going to do that. He's going to put on a little bit of weight. Uh, most, most players do when they enter the pros. And work on that third pitch. Work on the changeup. It's not as consistent as it needs to be. 
Um, I feel like it could probably move a little bit more, but he's a good prospect to be a top of the line pitching prospect if everything works out. Uh, Sean Burke is a righty in the system. Again, big guy, 6'6", 230. Had Tommy John back in college, was drafted after like 14 or 16 games in college because he had Tommy John um, in 2019 and then only got four games in 2020 with the pandemic. But uh, fastball, curveball, slider is the line here. The curveball got better last year. I think it can be a plus pitch. Uh, it's an 11 to 5, so it's not directly vertical. It's on a 12 to 6. It's off, ang- it's off angle a little, uh, but really tight breakdown, good depth to it deep into the strike zone. Gets to around 80 miles an hour. Works against lefties. Uh, the slider is, I'd say, I'd say average. I think the, the, the slider, it looks, it, it, it's like a faster version of the curveball, right? Two-plane break as well. Uh, I, Honestly, I would rather him focus on the changeup. Um, it's he doesn't throw it that often, but it disguises arm speeds really well with the fastball. And so I think if he can improve that, keep the gains on the curveball, you're looking at somebody who could could be a, a a top five pitching prospect or top five prospect for you. The issue is he's already in triple A. How much more improvement? on kind of a fundamental level with your base pitches can you expect from a guy already in AAA? This is that conversation we've had in the past about development and kind of how that works. A couple other guys real quick. Uh, Christian Mina, the right-hand pitcher. So big arsenal, curveball's his best pitch, but the curveball, fastball, again, the changeup blends really well with the fastball. I've noticed a lot of the White Sox changeups blend well with their fastballs. I don't know if that's something that the White Sox are specifically teaching or if it's just a coincidence, but I see that. I like that a lot. Uh, I, I do think here with Mina, the issue is the curveball is his best pitch, and then he has a slider that he throws as well, and the slider and the curveball don't differentiate enough. And so like, it's, 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 it's something, if he can get more velocity on the slider so that it separates from the curveball, because the curveball uh, is sitting low 80s, but sometimes it'll tick up 83, 84. The slider's like 84 to 86. So they're close enough where he he needs to throw the slider a little harder because the fastball is like 92 to 94. It can touch 96. And then the changeup's around 87, which is a good split, good divide. It has a, you know, again, the arm speed matches and everything. It's just differentiate the slider a little more and you're going to have four pitches that are all at least average with the curveball being plus and the fastball being above average. So I do like him. I think he has more farther to go than some of the others, but he's also one of the youngest. Uh, he, he was one of five pitchers under the age of 20 to get at least a hundred innings last year and uh, came in second to Andrew painter of the Phillies, who we talk about all the time as far as ERA 3.8 and strikeout rate, which is 29%. So again, he's, Farther to go, but I think he has a higher ceiling. And so I like that a lot. And then there's a couple other guys here. Norhe Vera, huge fastball. Uh, promising slider, needs to work on the changeup a bit. And then Peyton Paulette, recovering from Tommy John that he had in 2022 in college. But fastball, curveball, changeup guy. Question is, there is going to be, what kind of form does he take when he comes back from the Tommy John? In just a minute, I want to get to some position players and some, some, some work that needs to be done with some different organizations. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. Did you know that driving high is considered driving under the influence? That's right. Driving under the influence of marijuana is against the law in every state, even in states where marijuana is legal. And that means driving high could get you a DUI. If you think law enforcement officers can't tell when you're driving high, you are wrong. Your friends can tell. Coworkers can tell, your parents can tell. So what makes you think that law enforcement officers don't know when you're driving high? Driving under the influence of marijuana can slow your response time and change how you perceive time and speed. So even if you think you're fine to drive when you're high, you're not. Because the bottom line is, if you feel different, you drive different. And driving high is driving under the influence. So remember, drive high, get a DUI. 
more the New Year's resolutions from Baseball America and just trying to pick out some of the ones that were different from what we've given you over the last couple of days. I found it interesting. I think we've touched on this before, but talking about the Cincinnati Reds, it said their resolution is bigger where all the prospect, uh, where all the shortstops play. So if you look at the top 10 or what would be a top 10 for the Reds right now, everybody, there's like three, I, I, I have three pitchers. I have Chase Petty, Connor Phillips, and Brandon Williamson in the top 10. Everybody else is an infielder. And most of them are shortstops. And so you're in a situation where you've got to figure out what's going to happen to these guys. Uh, And this doesn't count Jose Barrero, who was the number one prospect in the system a couple years ago, just graduated, uh, is listed as a shortstop, got a little bit of time at second base, and debuted in center field last year. Literally first game he played as a professional baseball player in center field was in the majors. But, you know, that's just how that, that's just how it goes. And so trying to figure out who goes where. Uh, Ellie De La Cruz is the big wild card here, right? There's there's just so many questions about Ellie De La Cruz. And a lot of it is just we don't understand Ellie De La Cruz. He does things that nobody else does. Okay. 31% strikeout rate. And when you hear that, it's like, okay. That's probably bad. A guy who strikes out 31% of the time is going to be batting like what? 220, 225. He hit over 300. It's like that combination just almost never happens, but he's such a unique player. A lot of what you do with these position players hinges on what do you do with Ellie De La Cruz? Uh, He's got the best raw power in the organization. He's one of the fastest players, the strongest arm. He's like the best, one of the best athletes that the Reds have ever had. And they had Deion Sanders for a while. So defensively, he, I think he could be an above average shortstop. I think he's probably uh, an elite defender at third. I think that he has the arm strength and the speed and the baseball instincts to go to center field. And so... The question is, when do you decide, here's, what, here's the plan. He's made it clear he wants to be the shortstop of the future. Again, he's got the range. He's got the arm strength. Uh, he's, you know, he, he can make plays in the hole while running, doing all of that. But you do have better defenders in the system. Edwin Arroyo is probably your best infield defender. And so... What I love is the 20 baseball America has a thing where they project out the 2026 lineup for the team. Uh, They don't account for trades in there. They just like players in, they don't account for free agency players in the organization. Where do we think they'll be? And it's really interesting to see what they think about all of these guys. So uh, they have Edwin Arroyo as the starting shortstop. They like his defense more than, Anybody else's? They've got Noel V. Marte, who was the center, one of the centerpieces of the Luis Castillo deal. They've got him at third base. They have Ellie De La Cruz in center. Uh, they have Cam Collier, the third baseman who was taken in the draft, in right field. He's got below average foot speed, but he's got a cannon for an arm. And then there's other infielders that aren't even listed on here. Spencer Steer, who was up last year, utility guy. I think that's the best role for him. Matt McClain has played shortstop, has played second base, has played center field back at UCLA. Uh, they don't have him listed on here. I think he's another option to cover your center field, as well as Jose Barrero, who's also not on this list. Uh, you have Jonathan Indy at second base still. And then Christian Encarnacion Strand is listed as your starting first baseman. Uh, with Sal Stewart, who's listed as a third baseman, as the DH. It's just, it's a situation where you've got so many guys, and we don't talk about this a ton, or I don't bring this up and discuss this enough, but not everybody's going to make it, right? We've, We've gone over the numbers, but the most likely outcome for any individual prospect is that they don't make it in baseball. And so you have to start, looking at the fact that you don't have any prominent outfield prospects in your top 30, really. You don't have anybody super promising in the lower minors. You have a bunch of shortstops. 
And so you have to start addressing this organizational change. Your options are trade some of these shortstops or outfielders or convert some of these shortstops to outfielders. Uh, either way, Cincinnati needs to figure that out this year. They need to figure out who's going to go where. As much as I love L.A. De La Cruz at short, I do think he'd be an amazing center fielder. I do think he would be a fantastic third baseman as well. I think his defense could get to the level, not even exaggerating, the level of a Nolan Arenado. That's something defense gets better as players advance through the minors. I know Elio Cruz doesn't have an, I think is some around 950 fielding percentage in the minors. Nolan Arenado, before he debuted, was down in that same area in the minors, and he got better through the minors and is now one of the better third base defenders in all of baseball. I think Ellie De La Cruz's ceiling at third base is a similar level of defense. But a fantastic week this week. We have so many questions for the Monday Mailbag that we're going to do part of it tomorrow and part of it on Monday. If you have questions for the show, I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball, shows on Twitter at Locked On Farm, or you can email us, LockedOnMLBProspects at gmail.com. Until tomorrow's show, this has been Locked On MLB Prospects. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.